Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Monad Idrisi, author of the Muslim Narcissist book and empowerment coach for Muslims. In today's podcast, I'll be speaking about how you can use the month of Ramadan to heal from your traumas. And these could be childhood traumas or they could be traumas that you are enduring living with a narcissist or narcissists. And as always, just before I jump in, if you could kindly like the podcast, share it and do subscribe to the channel if you would like to receive future content. And as you know, and I've mentioned before, liking the podcast will help the video to appear in search results and in recommended videos for other people. So we all know as Muslims the virtues of Ramadan. If you are a non-Muslim listening to this, you can do a simple Google search or a YouTube search and you could find loads of videos about what makes the month of Ramadan so special. And if you're a Muslim and you need a reminder, you know, you can find loads of videos by preachers like Dr. Amr Suleiman and Mufti Mink and Bilal Asad. Many of them speak extensively about the virtues of Ramadan. So I won't go into all of that here to save on time. And because so much knowledge is already out there on the internet about Ramadan. So I wanted to jump straight into the subject of how people can deal with their traumas during the month of Ramadan, how you can utilize it to the max so that inshallah you will be able to follow the steps that I'm going to mention in this podcast. There will be simple steps inshallah that you can easily follow to give you the best chance at addressing and processing and moving on inshallah from your traumas. So do try your best to stay with me until the very end. You may want to take a notepad and pen out and just take some notes so you could jot down some ideas that you have in each of the steps. And essentially, this podcast is a gift for everyone who cannot afford counselling and coaching. So I pray that you find it beneficial and that you implement the exercises and the steps that I give you. So this is not just for Ramadan. You can implement all of these steps in any other time of the year. So I'm just doing it now so that you can reap the benefits and the barakah, the blessings of the virtues of Ramadan, it being a holy month and, you know, it's a prime time for all your prayers to be answered, inshallah, especially during fasting hours and during the night prayers of Tahajjud. So I just wanted to give people a heads up that it will be harder to implement these steps when you're living with a narcissist or multiple narcissists, okay? And the reason for that is because you are still in the vicinity of their satanic energy. And when you are living in the satanic energy field of narcissists, they will continue to trigger you. And when they trigger you, you will find it very difficult to keep your peace, keep your sanity, and to remain steadfast in implementing the exercises that I teach you. So those who do live with narcissists will have to work extra hard to be able to heal because it's really hard to do that when you're still living with your abusers. So these steps are actually more effective on people who are out of the satanic energy field. So if you no longer live with your abusers, if you're divorced, if you've moved away from toxic family, this is mainly for you. Okay, because like I said, it's very difficult for you to heal while you're still with your abusers. So I do encourage everyone to remove yourself from the presence of these people if it's possible. And if it's not possible, then you'll just have to work extra hard to do these exercises. Okay, because they will try to stop you. They will try to sabotage your progress and they will try to trigger you at every opportunity to set you back. So the first step that I would like to speak about would be Allah's wisdom and purpose behind allowing us to experience traumas and difficulties and hardships from childhood. Now again, for the sake of saving time, I would like to refer you all to podcast number nine, which is why does God allow narcissists to have innocent children who will be raised in toxic homes? So I answer this question in detail in that podcast So you may actually want to pause this podcast here and go and listen to that one now if you haven't listened to it already, because it will help you to form a much deeper understanding 
of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows children to go through certain hardships that are out of their control, right? So we can't choose who our parents are. Why is it that certain children, especially the empathic children, why is it that Allah gives them narcissistic and problematic parents? Well, this podcast, inshallah, will help you to understand the wisdom, Allah's hikmah behind that, okay? So this is really important that you get a full understanding of this from an Islamic perspective. And you can also jump to podcast number 10, which is about how to heal and move on from sexual abuse that may have taken place during childhood. So again, I have addressed all of these subjects and exhausted them in detail. Please do listen to them first before you carry on with this podcast. It will help you immensely. Or you could just continue listening to this one and then visit the other ones afterwards. So I want to give you some background context in regards to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us hardships. And it goes back to the story of Adam alayhi salam and Hawa. So after they ate from the tree and Adam alayhi salam and Hawa began their descent from paradise to earth as a result of listening to Iblis and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 24, قَالَ اهْبِطُوا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوا وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حِينَ So Allah said to Adam and Hawa, descend as enemies to each other. Because remember, Iblis was also sent to earth with them. Okay, so Allah is saying here that you are descending as enemies to each other. You will find in the earth a residence and provision for your appointed stay. Appointed stay means that this is a temporary life for humans. Okay, a temporary life that will end one day and it's not permanent. So we already have information here that indicates that we are going to have hardships in this life because of the fact Iblis is with us. Okay, he's with us. He's an enemy to us, which means that he's going to try and deviate and corrupt and ruin the lives of as many people as possible. And he's going to do that via waswas via his soldiers, via his progeny, via his children and his soldiers and armies. So he knows that whispering into the psyche of the human being works to corrupt the human being, okay? So this is what he teaches his soldiers and his progeny and his children, everybody. He teaches all the evil jinn how to whisper into the psyche of human beings to corrupt them. And this is why we have a qareem. Al-waswas al-khannas is the evil whisperer, okay, because it worked with Adam alayhi salam, so Iblis teaches this to the rest of his followers, okay, infiltrate the psyche and the minds and the hearts of the human beings and you'll get them. So we already know we're going to have hardships because these evil jinn are with us all the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us in Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 112, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ مَا فَعَلُوهُ فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ Which translates to, And we have made for every prophet an enemy, devils from mankind and the jinn. And they inspire to one another decorative speech in delusion. But if your Lord had willed, they would not have done it. So leave them and that which they invent. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here that we have made for every prophet an enemy because Allah is the one who ordered Iblis to descend to earth. So Allah already knows that every prophet will have an enemy. Every human being is going to have an enemy. And he taught Adam alayhi salam how to overpower Iblis. Okay, so that Iblis no longer controls him with his whispering. And this is the valuable information that Adam alayhi salam had passed down to all his children. And that's how the prophets got hold of all of this information about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Iblis. And they learned about the angels through Jibreel alayhi salam when Jibreel came to bring them the message of prophethood. 
So we understand and know here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create anyone to be evil. Okay, the human beings who are evil today, or the ones you know, weren't created to be evil. Allah tells us in this ayah, they inspire one another in decorative speech to delude one another. Okay, so the human beings who have been deluded by the whisperings of the shayateen, you're right, they've been deceived by the whisperings of their qareen. They are the ones who become evil because they are now controlled and overpowered by their evil jinn. Okay, that's how human beings become evil. No one was created to be evil. Even Iblis himself was not created to be evil. But it's the evil whisperings of the jinn that cause human beings to become evil when they follow them and they obey them and they take the qareen, the evil jinn, as their master. So the traumas that you would have gone through in life from childhood, well into your teenage years, well into your adulthood, would have been caused by people who are controlled by their evil jinn. Okay, these are people who are manipulated and deceived by the constant rhetoric in their minds and the orders that are given to them by their evil jinn. Okay, I really want you to understand this because... A lot of people take it personally. A lot of people believe that the reason why they went through childhood trauma and traumas during their adulthood, maybe it could be with in relationships or in a marriage, for example, is because of them as people. It's because they're unworthy of love. They're undeserving of good treatment. They start to take it personally. And when you take it personally, it turns into a trauma. Okay, I'll give you an example of a child who goes through a trauma witnessing his or her parents' divorce. And because this child heard their parents arguing so much about them, maybe them not doing their homework, them not going to bed on time, them being difficult at school, you know, getting into school fights, now they're hearing their parents argue about them. They now take it personally when they see their parents' divorce and they blame themselves for it. They tell themselves a story that I am the reason why my parents have divorced. I am unworthy. I am someone who is so bad that even my parents don't want to stay in a family because of me. Okay? When the real reason for the divorce could have been betrayal. Okay? The wife may have betrayed her husband or vice versa. Or something terrible happened that the child doesn't know about. But because the child focused on all the arguing that happened as a result of him or her, they take it upon themselves and blame themselves for their family splitting up. And this becomes a childhood trauma. Okay, so it's never the problem of the child, but rather how they perceive a situation that makes it a trauma. So if we speak about, for example, children who get physically abused, okay, or sexually abused, is it the child who is the problem or the adult? It's the adult who is the problem. They have a disorder, right? They've got a serious mental health problem to be abusing children in that way. But children take it on as a trauma because they take it personally, okay? They believe they're bad. They believe they're damaged. They believe they deserve it. They buy into the narrative of them being people who don't deserve anything good in the world. And this is exactly how a lot of children turn narcissistic and they go on to develop full-on NPD because they carry their childhood beliefs with them into adulthood. Okay, They don't understand that adults who abuse them have a chronic disorder. They don't understand any of that yet. But what they do understand is this happened to me because I'm not a good child, because there's something wrong with me. And because they never had anyone to talk to about it or to help process their emotions or help them express their emotions, they held on to that narrative, okay? They held on to that understanding and they took it with them into adulthood. And that's why so many narcissists have PTSD, because it's long-term trauma, it's trauma that they never got over since childhood for that particular reason. Because they've carried it with them 
and their qarin has fueled those thoughts. Okay, so once you enter teenage years, your PTSD is fueled because your qarin constantly reminds you of how awful you feel about yourself because of everything that happened to you in your childhood. So this is the first step, right, to understand why you went through what you went through. And a therapist can really help you with this, okay? This is the kind of work that I do. I get on one-to-one calls with clients and I help them break down their childhood traumas to get to the root cause of why they feel a certain way, why they have PTSD, why they have this long-term grudge against their parents or why they feel such hatred within themselves. I get to the core issue of the problem and alhamdulillah, we always manage to resolve it. Okay, we always manage to come to an educational understanding of what happened to them. Because the first step in healing is always to understand. Okay, and you understand via education. So understanding why we have hardships from an Islamic perspective is critical for your healing journey. Because it allows your brain to accept that, yes, if Iblis was sent to earth with Adam alayhi salam, then naturally, naturally, there are going to be loads of people who will be satanic. And unfortunately, many of those people become parents. Many of those people become your siblings and your husbands and your wives. And you deal with them in this life and you develop traumas from dealing with them, but you don't understand why they are that way. So you, so you basically take on everything personally and you look at yourself as the problem because you can't make any other sense of it, right? When you can't make sense of everything that's happened to you, the only solution is to just throw it on yourself. It must be because of me. I'm the one who's not good. I'm the one who's pathetic. I'm the one who's not smart. I'm the one who's not worthy of love and care and attention and affection and all of these things. That's what happens when you don't understand the context, the Islamic context behind the hardships that we have with people who give us trauma. Now, of course, not every person who gives us trauma does it intentionally. There will be many people who do it unintentionally and that will be from their own ignorance. So again, therapy can really help you with this because sometimes a therapist can identify where something got lost in translation okay where a child may have misunderstood something and then taken that on as a trauma where someone may have misinterpreted communication or behavior as being intentional when it wasn't so this is something that you really need one-to-one help with because everyone's case is different and trauma is subjective for everyone okay so what could be traumatic for you may not be traumatic for someone else For example, you may have a childhood trauma of being slapped on the face, whereas someone else may not have perceived a slap on the face in their childhood as a trauma, but rather being hit with a wooden spoon is what they consider to be traumatic. So everyone's different. You can't tell people that what they experienced isn't considered to be a trauma. Everyone perceives traumatic events in different ways. I mean, the person who perceived being slapped on the face as a child as a trauma will have that trauma reignited when someone in their adulthood does that to them. So they will react in a very exaggerated way to the abuser. So the abuser will see it as being a very over-exaggerated reaction to a slap on the face. So the victim might rage and go into a huge tantrum because you've triggered their childhood trauma again. You've reminded them of how much they hated that slap on the face when they were children. So someone might do that to them and they react in a rage and people won't understand. It was just a slap on the face. It's not a big deal. Why are you over-exaggerating? Why are you being a drama queen? It's because of that childhood trauma. Okay, so you can apply this to many other examples, but you get what I'm saying. It's 
very important to not belittle people's childhood traumas and what they perceive as a trauma in general. I've seen videos about it where people laugh at the things that people consider to be traumas when you shouldn't because there are certain things in life that people go through and in certain circumstances that really burn them at that time, especially when you're a child and you have no idea why that's happened and you just carry that resentment and that anger and that bitterness because no one's there to explain to you why that happened and you've got no one to talk to. So you carry it with you until adulthood. So people, you know, ridicule others for having you know, traumas like being slapped on the face when they don't understand. They don't understand why it's such a big deal. So this is the first step in understanding that we are going to be surrounded by shayateen al-ins and shayateen al-jinn from the story of Adam. So we're going to go back to the story of Adam alayhi salam after he descended to earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that they will lead a life of hardship in the dunya. Okay, so for example, food is not going to come easy like it does in Jannah. You know, they're used to just clicking their fingers and whatever it is that they crave will come to them. No, they are now being taught that they have to cultivate the land. They have to grow. They've got to harvest. They've got to hunt for food. They've got to protect themselves from wild animals. And they have to go foraging and they have to go and look for water. And they have to go through childbirth and humans will die in this dunya and they will get ill in this dunya and so on and so forth. But the biggest hardship would be that Adam salam has to constantly battle the whispers of the shaitan because as you can imagine, Iblis is now super mad at him. He's now blaming Adam for being expelled from Jannah. So now he's on his case. Iblis is now on the case of Adam to try and corrupt him and Hawa and their children. And remember, he did manage with Adam's son Cain when he murdered his brother Abel. So Iblis did not leave him alone and he became Adam's greatest hardship. Okay, so everything else he was able to deal with, but it was stressful dealing with Iblis. Because Iblis was out for revenge, even though it's so ironic because it was Iblis who encouraged Adam to eat from the tree. And as a result, they both got expelled. But Iblis did not expect that he would be expelled as well. He only expected Adam and Hawa to be expelled and for Iblis to remain because he's now proven to Allah that this new creation is faulty. So what's it got to do with me? I've just done you a favor by showing you that you cannot rely on this new creation so he didn't expect to be expelled from jannah as well he only expected adam and Hawa to be expelled and he expected to have his position returned as the favorite okay because now his mission is complete now he got adam to disobey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which means that he can reclaim his place as the favorite one again but that didn't happen okay that didn't happen And that's why Iblis is so mad at Adam and the rest of mankind. Okay, His children are all included in that hate. Anyone related to Adam Iblis hates and he will take his revenge on. And that's why he sends all the evil jinn to humans. And that's why all of us have an evil Qareen with us. They are all from Iblis. And there was once a time... I've mentioned this before in a podcast where Iblis went to Musa and he asked Musa, if I was to repent, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me? Ask Allah. So Musa went and asked and Allah said, I will forgive him if he prostrates to the grave of Adam and that was the one thing he couldn't do because he still holds on to that resentment of Adam for being the cause of Iblis losing his position as the favorite with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said to Musa, I didn't prostrate to him when he was alive. You want me to do that now? He is dead? Forget it. And that was that. He left it. Until today, Iblis is unable to prostrate to the grave of Adam 
because of this intense hatred he has for the way things turned out. So Adam السلام, he remained resolute and he proved himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is capable of overpowering Iblis and they thrived in the dunya and they had many children who until today worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, until today we have Muslims, we have believers and that comes from Adam السلام, being really steadfast when it came to ignoring and dismissing the whispers of Iblis. Okay, and that also comes from the education that we receive through the bloodline of Adam السلام. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 286, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها which means indeed Allah does not burden a nafs with more than it can handle. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equipped Adam alayhi salam to deal with life in this dunya. He gave him physical strength. He gave him intelligence. He gave him knowledge of everything, including how to overpower Iblis. So he didn't go without anything. He had everything he needed to be able to cultivate a life in this dunya and also how to battle the demon who was constantly on his back okay so essentially iblis was his qareen following him everywhere so we understand here that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever give someone a hardship that he or she cannot handle if you look back on your life you will see that you've had so many hardships and you're still standing today. You managed to deal with all of them. You managed to overcome and move on from all your hardships. You're still standing today. You're still alive. You're still, alhamdulillah, you've managed to cope with it. And the reason why you've managed to cope with your hardships is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Sharh, Ayah 5 to 6, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى so surely with hardship comes ease. Surely with hardship comes ease. So you would have had something given to you as rizq during the time of your hardship that got you through the hardship. Okay, I really want you to focus on this as an exercise. I want you to note down the blessings you had at the time of every hardship. For example, some people may have toxic parents but amazing friends. Some people have toxic friends but amazing parents. Some people might have a supportive husband and difficult children. You won't, you won't have a perfect life. No one will ever have a perfect life. But let's just say you lost a parent to death. Look at the people around you who supported you. That was your yusr. That was your ease. And look at the times when you lost a lot of money, but you were blessed with a beautiful daughter or son. Or look at the time when you married such a horrible person, but you came out with a stronger connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of all the hardships you went through with that person, because turning to Allah in prayer was all you had. Okay, there's always your sir. And that's what gets you through every hardship. Okay, it's a mercy from Allah. He will never give you a hardship without giving you something that will ease that hardship for you. And again, that can come in the form of support, in the form of the love of other people, in the form of help, in the form of people giving you money or charity or something you need at that time. There will always be something to help you get through a hardship. And that's a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that with every hardship I give you, there will be ease. It comes as a package. The hardship will come with its ease. There is no such thing as pure hardship with no ease. So one exercise that I like to do with um, some of my clients is to get a sheet of paper and fold the sheet of paper in half. And on the left side, I want you to write down your hardships. Okay, the, the traumas, the really difficult experiences that you had in life and then on the opposite side I want you to write down what the ease was 
what you got out of it, okay? What are the, the positive things that came out of that hardship? What did you realise at that time? Maybe you realised that your neighbour was the most supportive person in that time. Or maybe you realise that the people around you don't actually love you when you lost your money and they were only there because you had money. So it opened your eyes to who your real friends are. Write them down and it gives you something positive to focus on. And when you have something positive to focus on, you no longer focus on the trauma, which is what your Karin wants. So there'll be two elements to this exercise. The first part of it would be for you to understand that whatever it is you went through in childhood had nothing to do with you. You can detach from the blame. You can detach from the responsibility because the adults are meant to be responsible for taking care of you. They are responsible for making sure that you are safe emotionally, physically, spiritually and so on. So you need to sit with yourself. Sit with yourself and really think about everything that you have taken responsibility for that you can now let go of because you were dealing with people who had a disorder, okay? It wasn't your problem, it was theirs. And I recommend that you sit after Salah, especially after Isha or, you know, after Tahajjud prayer, just sit and just think about it. You can journal it, you know, sometimes it really helps to write down your thoughts and feelings. And if you want to talk to a therapist about it, if you want to go one-to-one, you know, you can drop me an email. My email's below and we can work through it. If you feel like you don't need that kind of help and you can do it on your own, alhamdulillah, that's great. Just continue doing that until you come to an understanding of why people are the way they are. I've written my book to help you with this. So if you're struggling with this, and again, you can't afford counselling, please order my book. My book has everything in it. It will really help you understand people's disorders and why you went through so much childhood trauma. So please do read it if you haven't already and listen to podcast 9 and 10 because that will give you so much closure that you never thought you could get. Okay, I wrote it for that purpose and I recorded them for that purpose. And then the second element would be for you to start focusing on the positive, okay, on the yusr rather than the usr. Okay, we want to focus on the positives. What happened in the past happened in the past. We now need to focus on how we learn from that and how we can move on from that. Okay, so understanding and education and seeking knowledge is the most important part of healing. Because a lot of people, they will tell others who are suffering from PTSD and demonic issues and, you know, the victims of narcissism and codependency they will just tell them go and pray go and pray make dua Allah can turn your life around it doesn't work okay I'm not undermining or belittling the power of dua and prayer but when you're praying and you have no idea what it is you went through and you're still struggling to make sense of it you're going to struggle to make a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay you can only connect with Allah once you fully understand what happened to you, so you can put it to bed. And now you can focus on having a relationship with Allah. So a lot of people feel guilty when they cannot establish a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're still wondering, why did that happen to me? Why me? You know, why was I abused as a child? And why did I marry such a horrible man when I've been such a, a wonderful woman all my life? I've stayed away from all the major sins. Why did I marry such a, a demon? And maybe a man says, I worked so hard to build up my business. Why did I get deceived and conned by my best friend in business? He stole my money. He, you know, he conned me. All of these traumas, if you're not able to make sense of them you will struggle in your spirituality I promise you you will really struggle the most important part of your healing journey is to understand and fully gain the knowledge that you need to be able to heal and move on from what happened to you once you can make sense of it I promise you you're going to enjoy your prayers you're going to enjoy 
all the worship rituals so much more because you will feel like you've had the closure you needed and you won't get those answers when you make dua or when you're praying all that knowledge is not going to come to you while you're praying it's going to come to you while you seek knowledge and that's why seeking knowledge is an act of ibadah it's worship because you are trying to help yourself by doing that you know you improve yourself you better yourself as a human being and a Muslim and you also give yourself the opportunity to overpower your qareen so you strengthen your nafs when you're able to seek knowledge about your problems and you invest in the help you need so that you can finally get the closure on what happened to you doesn't it make more sense for you to enjoy a relationship with Allah after you've done that work you know it doesn't mean that you need to stop praying you continue praying, you continue fasting, continue everything that you're doing, even if it feels empty, it doesn't matter, just continue, even if you can't focus in your salah, it doesn't matter, please continue, don't stop, because this will all improve once you get the closure via knowledge on what happened to you and why your life is the way it is, why you went through certain hardships, why Allah had to send you certain lessons to learn from, And why there are certain demons in your life and what their purpose is, okay? It's deep knowledge seeking that is so satisfying when you get the answers you need. And I'm really trying to give everyone all the answers they need in the book and this podcast channel so that you can process everything and move on from it so you can enjoy a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, it's only until then can you be set free because it all starts in the mind, it's all in the psyche, and that's what Iblis and his soldiers attack first. So, if we address the mind first and how you perceive the world, and how you perceive yourself, how you perceive the people around you, and your traumas, and your past, and everything you went through, if we can address that first, everything else will follow suit. So, it starts with your education. And once you get the education you need, you will be able to move on to better things in life. And you will be able to build that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So that tawakkul doesn't come just like that. You're not born with tawakkul. You're not born with that trust in Allah. It's built over time and it's built with knowledge. Okay? So that's why the first word in the Quran that came down was iqra. Iqra reads. Because if you're a knowledge seeker, then everything else in your life will be easy. You will understand everything that's happening to you. And you won't take it personally because you will understand that Allah has prepared you for it. And he's warned you about it. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 155, مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ So Allah says, And we will certainly test you with a touch of fear and famine and loss of property, life and crops. But give good tidings to those who patiently endure and say when struck by a disaster or a hardship, Surely to Allah we belong and to him we will all return. Okay, so again, this goes back to the story of Adam. When he told Adam that this is just a temporary life. Everything that we are going through now, it's temporary because this is not meant to be our home. Right, the dunya is not meant to be our permanent resting place. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to get too attached to the dunya, he gives us hardships now and again to make us uncomfortable here, to make us miserable here, to make us feel like, oh, we just can't wait for the day when we go back. We go back to Jannah because life in this dunya is too hard. And that's why the believers are tested the most. That's why there's the hadith that states that when Allah loves a 
person, he afflicts him with trials or he afflicts her with trials. Why? Because it's a reminder that this is not your permanent home. Don't get too attached to this dunya. This dunya will break your heart. And this dunya has demons within it. And this dunya has evil within it. And it's all about survival. You know, too many people are living in survival mode where you're constantly working hard to pay your bills, pay your rent, and just get through life, you know, making ends meet. It's stress. And then you've got health problems and you've got childbearing issues to deal with and you've got marital problems and you've got relationship problems with your parents and so on and so forth. You don't get any of that in Jannah. Okay, so Allah makes the believer uncomfortable in this life. He makes them uncomfortable so that they constantly strive to earn Jannah. They don't want this anymore. They don't want this dunya. They want to go to a place where there is no hardship and no demons and no narcissists and no psychopaths and no having to work a nine to five job to pay your rent and pay your bills and there's no more pain in giving birth and people want that. The believers want that. And so Allah reminds them all the time that this dunya has been created for hardship. It's been created to break your heart. Yes, there are blessings within it. And yes, you know, we're meant to enjoy the dunya and what Allah's given us as a portion of it. But it's not meant to be invested in heavily as our permanent place of residence. Okay, Allah doesn't want us to invest in it. He just wants us to do what he's asked us to do. Okay, avoid the major sins. Treat everyone well. Don't oppress anybody. Look after your nafs because it's your nafs who will be accountable on the day of judgment. And be wary of Iblis and his soldiers. That's all he's asked us to do. Nothing else. So whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that we're becoming attached to the dunya or attached to people or attached to demons, we don't know they're demons, but we're becoming attached to them, he allows them to hurt us. And if he sees that money, having excess money, is causing us to lose our deen, he creates a hardship where we lose it to bring us back, to remind us, this dunya, you won't have anything forever in this dunya. You're going to lose a lot in this dunya. You may be overly attached to someone and then Allah causes that person to die to remind you, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Right, we're all going to go back. And if you look at the hadith, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet Muhammad said, the world is a prison for the believer and a paradise for the unbeliever. Okay, it's in Sahih Muslim. And this is the meaning of that hadith. It's a paradise for the unbeliever because they are so attached to this world, right? They want the fame, they want the money, they want the luxury and the private jets and the 10 homes in 10 different countries and they want to marry the richest person in their city and, you know, they are so attached to the dunya because they're not considered to be believers. So Allah doesn't afflict them with so many hardships. That's why it looks like narcissists and psychopaths have an easy life, but it's because they are so obsessed with the dunya. They're so obsessed about money and being famous and, and you know having all of that, that it doesn't look like they have a hard life. But actually they're getting their consequences for being this way in the form of not having the hardships the believers have, okay? So don't think it's because Allah loves them more. No, he only afflicts the believers with trials and hardships every so often because of the fact he doesn't want them to be so attached to the dunya because this dunya will hurt them. This dunya is going to depress them if they get too attached and then they lose what they gain okay, in money or status or whatever. So it's just a constant reminder, out of love and out of mercy for the believer, that Allah reminds them that this is not their place of residence, that they should strive for Jannah. And that's why the believers always do. And this is why people who own a nafs al inna, the highest level of nafs, are the most simple of people. They don't care about riches and luxury and all those things they want a simple life because 
they're not attached to anything and they're not materialistic. So the more materialistic you are, the more narcissistic you are and the lower in your level of nafs you become because it means that you are more attached to the dunya than those who have a higher level of nafs. Okay, so when Allah doesn't give you from this dunya, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you and it doesn't mean he doesn't see all your hard work to earn a lot of money and to have everything you want. It's because he is detaching you from the dunya and the more detached you become from the dunya, the more you're able to heal from all your traumas and all your problems. Because you don't rely on the validation of other people to feel good about yourself as a believer. Okay, you already know that you're special with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's another thing as well that a lot of people don't think about. When you pray for Jannah al firdaus al-A'la and you receive hardships, a lot of people don't realize that when you pray for Jannah al firdaus you actually pray for opportunities to earn genital for those. And those opportunities come through hardships because Allah's testing your patience and he's testing your faith and he's testing your trust in him. So if you pass on those three things, when you pray for genital for those at Allah, then you will earn it inshallah. And that's why a lot of people, they get confused. They're like, you know, I'm praying for an easy life and I'm praying for paradise. But I keep getting more problems. I'm losing everyone around me. I married a horrible person. I lost my money. I lost my company. Um, I've just found out that I've been diagnosed with cancer. Like, what's going on? Allah's not listening to me. He doesn't love me. He's actually punishing me by giving me everything I don't want. No, he's not. He's answering your dua. Because you asked for al firdos, so he's giving you an opportunity to earn it. And that's why the calamity for a believer is something welcomed. Okay? Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I only test those whom I love, I took the pain like it was an honor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Baqarah, Ayah 214, in response to those, who pray for Jannah al Firdaus? Am hasibtum an tadkhulu al Jannah wa lamma ya'tikum mathal al ladhina khalaw min qablikum massathum al ba'sa'u wa al dara'u wa zulzilu hatta yaqul al rasul wal ladhina amanu ma'a mata nasrullah ala inna nasrullah qarib And do you think that you will be admitted into paradise without being tested like those before you? They were afflicted with suffering and adversity and were so violently shaken that even the messenger and the believers with him cried out, When will Allah's help come? Indeed, Allah's help is always near. So I hope that explains to you as to why having the Islamic perspective on the subject of hardships is so important for your healing journey. Okay, it's something for you to think about. And for you to be able to self-reflect, which is the next step. So self-reflection comes as a result of you knowing this information. And again, it's after, you know, maybe you read the book and listen to the podcast that I recommended for you. Maybe it's you going for therapy sessions if you can afford them. If you can't, just continue seeking knowledge about your hardships and everything that you went through. And start journaling. Journaling really helps with self-reflection so now you can start writing down things like you know what you took ownership of and what you took the blame for and what are the things that you need to set yourself free from and you start working on those maybe you can ask yourself you know where did I go wrong what is it that I did that contributed towards my toxic relationship what is it that I have done that has caused my relationship with my parents to be so dysfunctional, okay? Or what is it that I'm doing as a parent with my own children that is not allowing me to enjoy parenting? So self-reflection is always more productive after you understand the Islamic perspective on hardships, okay? So now you can look at your situation 
in a more positive way and from an improved mindset of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instead of looking at yourself as someone who is punished and unloved by Allah, you now understand that hardships don't mean punishments for the believer. Okay, it's just a reminder, it's a nudge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like, hey, don't get too attached to this dunya. I love you and I want you to come back to a better place. So don't allow this person to drag you down. Don't allow this person to break your heart. Don't allow this situation to depress you and give you anxiety and PTSD when I've given you the tools to deal with it. I haven't given you any hardship that I know you can't handle. Look for the ease in your situation. Okay, when you focus on all of those, self-reflection becomes a lot easier. And then the next step with self-reflection would be to extract the lessons and the gems of wisdom from your hardships and your traumas and your childhood. So start to dig for the positive lessons that you gained from all of those situations. So for example, a lesson could be, you know, I had toxic parents, I will never be a parent like that to my own children. Or it could be, I will never dismiss or ignore red flags in a potential husband or wife ever again. Or, alhamdulillah, I didn't come out of my toxic marriage with nothing. I came out of it with more iman. So the lesson that I need to extract from my toxic marriage is that I needed this person in my life to push me to my knees and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me get out of that situation, which increased my iman when that happened. Okay, so extract the lessons journal the lessons that you came out with and the and the gems of wisdom where is Allah's wisdom in your hardships what is it that you gained from your hardship again it's a promise in the mal usri yusra so where is the ease in my hardship once you start journaling about all of these things you will start to gain a clearer picture of how you can actually move on with your life okay you can start clearing out cobwebs you can start to let go of some toxic emotions that are festering in your heart like envy jealousy anger bitterness resentment all of those emotions that you allow to bubble and fester in your heart will turn you into a narcissistic person okay that's what happens so start getting rid of, start doing a spring clear out of your heart, yeah, as you start to realise all of these things and you start to find answers for your hardships and you start to realise what the wisdom was in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing you to be in a certain situation because you needed it. Every situation that you have been in in your life, Allah knows that you've needed it. So it's up to you to figure out why Allah knows you needed that lesson. It's up to you to figure it out because he gave us brains. And we have this intelligence that no other creation has so that we can figure things out. I mean, even in the Quran, not everything is crystal clear in the Quran. There are some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left for our intelligence to figure out. Because he's given us all the signs. Okay, for example, he says, you know, have they not seen how the camels have been created, right? How the mountains have been created and how they hold the earth together. Have they not seen the moon and the stars and the sun and the skies? Have they not seen any of that? Do they not think? So there are lots of things that Allah wants us to come to the conclusion of. We need to come up with our own answers when it comes to our own situations and because he's given us many things to wonder about and ponder on. He's given us lots of things to think about. So he will give us the hardship, but it's up to us to find the reasoning behind it, to find the explanation, to find the cause of this hardship. Is it because Allah has punished me or because I brushed horrible red flags under the carpet? Yeah, I shouldn't blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
for allowing me to marry that person when I could clearly see from the beginning that person was stingy, that person was controlling, that person was rude to their parents, that person did not have much respect for me or my family. So yes, I take ownership of that and I learn from that lesson to never belittle red flags again. Okay, I'm, I'm mentioning this again because it's a common problem. A lot of people dismiss and ignore red flags and then they ask people, you know, why did Allah do this to me? You know, Allah hates me. Why did he give me such a horrible husband? But Allah gave us a brain, okay? And yes, we all go through stages of codependency where we're so familiar with the red flags that we normalize them and we don't see them as red flags and so on and so forth. But that's the lesson, right? That's the lesson Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us that there's something not quite right with us and there's a reason why we have ignored red flags. So he has to allow us to live it, live the consequences of our decision so that we understand how dangerous those red flags are. We have to live it. We have to see it. Some people can only learn that way. Some people can only learn by experience. Some people learn just from the advice of others. You know, someone will say to them, look, never marry a person who is like X, Y, Z. And they'll say, okay, we won't. We're going to avoid those people. And some people have to live the experience of marrying such a person so that they can understand. Everyone learns in different ways. It doesn't mean that Allah hates you or he's punishing you. He's just teaching you in the way he knows you're going to absorb the lesson properly. Okay. And again, you hear people say, oh, you know, how come Allah saved him or her from a horrible marriage? You know, something happened to stop that marriage going ahead. Allah must love that person, you know, for them to not marry a, a demon. No, it's just because that person didn't accept red flags. That person was more self-aware than you to not accept it, right? To see that as a danger point. But you still had a lot of learning to do. So he allowed you to marry that person for you to understand why these are red flags. So it's important for the believer to never have a bad perspective on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as soon as you step into the mindset of Allah punishing you, you're no longer that high-level believer because the Prophet Muhammad said that one of the greatest blessings of faith is the fact that everything Allah decrees for the believer, whether in ease or hardship, will be good for them. So Suhaib who reported that the Prophet Muhammad said, عَجَبًا لأمر المؤمن إن أمره كله خير وليس ذاك لأحد إلا للمؤمن إن أصابته سراء شكرا فكان خيرا له so wondrous is the affair of the believer, for there is good for them in every matter, and this is not the case with anyone except for the believer. If they are happy, then they thank Allah, and there is good for them. And if they are harmed, then they show patience, and there is good for them. And this is in Sahih Muslim. So it just shows us that it's so important to have a good belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay we see him in the best way and the believer never sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a tyrannical way you know if something goes wrong they don't jump to the conclusion that they're being punished they jump to the explanation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach them something out of his love and mercy and just having this mindset alone will unlock so many traumas for you especially if those traumas are faith-based so we know that one of the six pillars of Iman is to accept the divine decree. Okay, Qadr Allah. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us, because he knows it's what's best for us, we have to accept. So once you understand all of this, it will be easier for you to accept the Qadr. Okay, this is really important for you to have tawakkul and acceptance of the Qadr. Once you accept Qadr Allah, everything else becomes easy. And you'll find it easier to detach from many things in this dunya and many people in this dunya once you fully sit in the comfort of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got your back 
and that everything is going to happen in accordance to what has been written for you. Your divine decree has already been written. So why are you trying to escape it? You can't escape it. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You can make dua to change your qadr. Of course, if it's good for you, Allah will change it. And he will change it because you are praying with such sincerity that there may come a time when Allah will give you what you want and not turn it into a hardship for you. So for example, some people might really want to have children. Okay, and they pray desperately every day for children. And they remember this dua in every fard. And they remember the dua in tahajjud. And they remember it on Yom Arafah. And they remember it in Umrah and Hajj and Tawaf. And every possible opportunity they can have to pray for it, they'll pray for it. Okay, there are some people who are so desperate to have something, they will hold on to it for years and years and years. And they don't have it. And then Allah sees that they're not going to let go of this dua. Okay, they're not going to let go of it. They are praying for something that's not good for them. But they can't see it. So sometimes Allah will give you what you want for you to see why he did not give it to you when you wanted it. So you might have children and those children might turn your life into a living hell. Because we have spent so much of our time praying for what is not good for us and we don't know so when you pray it's actually better for you to just pray for what's good for you don't pray for something specific don't waste years of your life praying for something that Allah knows is not good for you so that you don't have to face the day when Allah gives it to you so that you can see why it's not good for you okay that's why people who pray to marry someone specific they go through a very turbulent marriage with that person later that person becomes very toxic or that marriage becomes very toxic because they wanted that person and only that person. But Allah knew that this person is not good for them. But okay, you are insisting on this dua. I'm going to give this person to you for you to see that you're making the wrong dua and you need to make it more open and ask for what's good for you rather than for something very specific that may not be good for your life. Okay, very important for you to understand. So accept your divine decree and you will only be able to accept it once you process everything that I've already told you in this podcast. Okay, it's a lot of work, but you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy the journey when you take the steps in this manner, in this order. Okay, you'll be more productive in your healing journey, especially when you manage to reach a place where you can find Allah in your trauma and as you know Iblis and all his soldiers and your Qareen and the Qareen of your abusers they hate more than anything that they try to destroy you but you actually end up finding Allah in the process okay you find Allah in the process you establish a stronger connection your faith gets stronger your tawakkul gets stronger your acceptance of the divine decree gets stronger you've won in that situation if you come out with more iman and more love for Allah than you started out with after these demons try to destroy you you're the winner nothing kills them more than that so if you Go back to the story of Adam alayhi salam. Can you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him how to overcome and overpower Iblis? Allah's doing the same with you. Okay, he wants you to overpower Iblis and overpower all the demons that he sends out to destroy you by coming out with a different outcome that they did not expect. Okay, you really shock demons when you come out of such a traumatic experience with more iman than you started out with. It baffles them and they hate it. They go into an internal rage about it. Like, how on earth did that happen? You know, we did everything to destroy her iman, destroy her self-esteem, cripple her or cripple him and make them hate the deen because we used and abused the deen to manipulate and do all of these horrible things to them, how on earth did they come out with more iman? If you're one of those people, you are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll say it again. 
if you are one of those people who came out of a traumatic experience with a demon, with more iman than you started out with, you are someone who is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is the rope he sent you to rescue you from such a traumatic experience. Okay, that's all he needed you in that experience for. To get closer to him and then he took you out. Listen to my podcast about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always rescues the believing empath. It's number 57 if you haven't listened to it already. Okay, it goes into more detail about this. So this is the stage where you are able to overpower your own qareen. Okay, once you start to gain an awareness of all this knowledge and you can help yourself as well by listening to lots of Islamic lectures. I always advise people to do that. It increases your iman. Read more Islamic books. Gain more knowledge from self-help books as well. And that will really increase your chances of you know, speeding up the healing journey, inshallah. But once you get to this stage, this is where you overpower your qareen. And when you overpower your qareen, you're no longer a victim of the whispering. You're no longer a victim of the damage they have caused you in a certain relationship or a certain hardship or experience. So you no longer allow your damaged self-esteem to dictate the outcome of your life. And you don't allow the beliefs that you know demonic people have fed you about yourself to be your reality. So once you start to break out of that reality and you start to see yourself in a different light and you start to value yourself as a believer above everything else, you start to rebuild your self-esteem and your identity and everything that's great about you, okay? Because now you manage to escape the environment of the narcissist or the demons around you and you can start working on building yourself again. Again, you know, you might need help with this in one-to-one counselling and coaching, which is fine. If you would like to reach out to me, like I said, my email is below. Just send me a brief about your case and I can help you with it, inshallah. So when you get to this stage, know that you have reached a powerful stage. And this is after you do all the work that I have already mentioned, the self-reflection, the journaling, all of that. You need to do that before you get to this stage because you need to have a solid understanding of how you got to that situation and the point where you're at now. Okay, once you have that understanding, you will be able to, you know, create a strategic plan going forward in how you're going to approach life, approach religion, approach your connection with Allah and how you're going to deal with the people around you, strangers, and so on and so forth, okay, you'll have a plan in place, like, I'm going to have boundaries next time when I meet strangers, I'm going to implement boundaries in the relationships I have now, and I will no longer, you know, dismiss or belittle red flags, or accept abuse and disrespect from people, all of that, So you can now put a strategic plan in place for your life and that will help you to become stronger and more confident going forward. Now, the next step after that would be to go through a complete body detox. Okay, and when I say body detox, I mean you start to nourish your body with goodness. And that can be good, healthy food. That can be getting back into an exercise routine, a regular one. That can be getting involved in healthy activities like maybe Tai Chi or doing things that, you know, just make you feel good. You could go to therapies like acupuncture that really helps to, you know, channel negative energy out of your body, reflexology, you know, all those lovely holistic therapies. You could go for massages, you could go for hijama. Hijama is amazing for removing trauma from your body and toxins that you've accumulated from stress and illness. You know, being in the environment with, with narcissists and so on. So these therapies really help. Um, like I said, you can take up a sport if you wanted to. And I'd really like you to invest time in your self-care. And when I say self-care, I mean, you know, watch your weight and go and get a new haircut. Take care of your skin. 
take care of your nails, take care of your, you know, your hair, everything about you, take care of your physical appearance, pamper yourself, book regular treatments for yourself in which you can gain some confidence when you feel good about yourself and when you look better. Okay, this is really important as well. Self-care is critical for your healing journey. And I'd also like you to journal about everything that you've done for people that you never got back. Okay, so for example, you were very loving, very caring, very nurturing. You would buy gifts for people. You would cook food for people. You'd always be there for people. Write it all down, what you used to do. And I want you to do it all for yourself. So you be the one to buy lovely gifts for yourself. And don't be stingy. Spend money on gifts for yourself. You know, buy yourself expensive gifts. Go and take yourself out to a fancy restaurant. Go on days out. Go on holidays. Go on weekends away. Pamper yourself. Go to spas. Go to the theatre. Go to the cinema. Do things for yourself that you never really did before. Okay? Everything that you invested into people, all the compliments you gave people, all the care you gave people, please give it to yourself. I want you to reverse it and I want you to give yourself the same compliments you gave other people. I want you to tell yourself that you're a wonderful person. I want you to tell yourself that you're a believer, that you're an empath, that you deserve good things, that you are worthy of good things and so on and so forth. Yeah, And I want you to take care of yourself by dressing yourself in nice clothes. I want you to buy yourself nice perfume and nice jewellery and just do all of those things. Even if you have to change the style of your beard, like I said, or your hairstyle, just go and do it. It will give you that feeling of being a new person after you come out of a horrible experience and after you gain the knowledge of all this that you've needed. Okay, so I want you to visualize yourself as a new person who's going to start a new life. And sometimes that requires a new look. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't see that old person. You don't see the the overweight, frumpy, you know, grumpy person. No, that has to go. You need to work on seeing a new person in the mirror. And that requires a lot of investment of love, care, time, attention money and sometimes new friends right you might have to look for new friends or socialize with a different group of people or you know join clubs and join social circles where you get to meet a different caliber of people you get to meet other empaths and other believers yeah even if you have that one friend who's an empath or you know an empathic believer spend more time with that person Okay, don't slip into your comfort zone of hanging out with your narc friends because it's what you're used to doing. No, if you want a different life, you've got to change your social circle as well. Change your friends, change who you hang out with. I promise you, if you do all of those things, you'll completely change as a person. And self-care is so important in this stage of healing. You're not going to do it in the first stage because you'll have no motivation for it. When you're still trying to figure out why everything happened to you you're going to be so preoccupied with that anxiety and that depression and those thoughts those intrusive thoughts and overthinking because you still don't have answers to even care about pampering yourself and and doing nice things for yourself and this is why this stage comes here okay towards the end because now your mind will be free and you will find a reason, you'll find a logical reason now to be doing these things for yourself. Because you've got the knowledge that you needed, you've made sense of everything, you've come to peace with everything, you've put things to bed. And now you can move on with your life and actually do things that you enjoy. And that's going to, you know, they're going to improve you as a human being and as a Muslim. So I follow this strategy with all of my clients. Okay, and this is why, alhamdulillah, I managed to get the results that I need with them because I understand that they need to understand first before they can dive into self-care. When you're depressed, the last thing you care about is self-care and you have no motivation to lose the weight, look better, feel better, 
go to restaurants, go and do the things that you enjoy. There'll be no motivation at all. So when people keep pushing self-care on those who are depressed and they try to get them motivated to do things, it's the wrong approach. Because as long as people have unanswered questions, they're going to remain in a state of anxiety and depression. Okay, so once you get to this stage, inshallah, regular exercise is important. Get that fresh air, get that adrenaline pumping in your in your body and go out every day and improve that blood circulation. And it will help to expel toxins from your body, from stress and from illness. Okay, and I also recommend that you fast regularly as well, because fasting will also allow the body time to expel toxins from the body and that's why Ramadan is such a wonderful time to do this healing because during fasting hours your body can focus on other processes in your body which is mainly detox so it's not being distracted with constant work on the digestive system right so when people are depressed Well, a lot of people, they do binge eat, they overeat, they're snacking all day. So your digestive system is in constant overdrive and your body has its focus on that rather than focusing on the detox system and burning fat and, you know, cell repair and so on. So it's really important for you to fast regularly. Not only will it be good for your deen and your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because fasting is the act of worship he loves the most, but it will also help you to remove lots of trauma from your body. Okay, there are some people who like to go for somatic exercises where they do the deep breathing to, you know, breathe out traumas and it can work, it can work. You just need to find some good practitioners who are not involved in shirk Okay, because a lot of these practitioners, they are Buddhist and Hindu. So you've got to be careful who you go to for that because they do incorporate some Buddhist and Hindu practices in their exercises. So maybe find a Muslim practitioner who does deep breathing exercises and inshallah that will definitely help as well. It's very relaxing and it can really help you to meditate and it will also train your mind to focus better in salah. So it will give you more khashur in your salah when you learn how to meditate properly. So the last stage of all of this would be to rebuild yourself a new sense of identity and a new sense of self-worth and self-value. So once you go through all of this and you start new hobbies and you start discovering new activities and new talents and you start you know, going back to things that maybe you were forbidden from doing before, maybe you're traveling more now, or you've picked up a previous hobby that you stopped doing because of depression, such as painting or horse riding or whatever it is. Once you pick that back up, you can now rebuild your sense of self and you can start to identify where your value lies and you work on that. Okay, you work on your self-esteem and your self-value to make yourself a person of value. And when you are a person of value, you have higher standards for yourself. Okay, so you will no longer accept any riffraff coming into your life. You'll no longer entertain a demon or even someone who's trying to hoover you back into their life. You won't accept any rubbish into your life anymore. If anyone is not willing to accept your boundaries, they can go. If anyone is not willing to have that respect for you as a human being and they don't see your value, they can go, you don't need them. You will lose that need for the validation of people, okay? You will no longer care about what people think. You will live your life in the best way with your foundation being you being a believer, okay? That's where your core value should lie, that you're an empath and you're a believer and you're working on yourself, and you have control over your qareen, you master those four things, you're good to go. You will elevate your nafs so high you'll never look back. You will never want to be any other kind of person once you come to that peace, okay, and you let your traumas go, and you come to an understanding that everything that's happened to you has happened by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's nothing you could do to change that. Your past is gone. There's nothing you can do about your past now, but accept it. Okay, accept it. 
And once you come to that acceptance, you'll be able to do great things with your life. Okay, your foundation has to be those four things. If it's not those four things and you base your self-value on other things that can come and go easily, you're never going to be happy and you're never going to be settled within yourself. So if you, for example, base your self-value on you being a doctor or a lawyer or a surgeon or you base it on being famous or you base it on being beautiful or handsome or you base it on being you know, super smart in your career and, you know, you're the CEO of X company, if you base it on those things and then you lose those things later, you're going to go back to square one, okay? So the foundation has to be your iman and it has to be, you know, you as a believer and in how you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because remember, a believer always sees Allah in the best way. If you do not see Allah in a good way, you are not a true believer. Okay, you're not a true believer and this is something you urgently need to work on, okay? Because the goal at the end of the day is to die as believers and to know that we will be going to our permanent place of residence and that everything we have here we'll leave behind. All the trauma, all the experiences that we had that were bad, everything that we had and lost, we're all going to leave them behind. It won't even matter, okay? What will matter is how you dealt with those situations and that you came out of those situations as believers. So I'll end it here. I hope, inshallah, that's helped and that it's inspired many of you to work on yourselves, inshallah, this Ramadan. Whether you be empaths, codependents or narcissists, you know, you can you can all do this in a work. So kindly do share this podcast with people whom you feel could really benefit from this knowledge and from these steps to heal. OK, especially again, if they're young or they can't afford counseling sessions. And I just remind you again, if you do need one to one counseling and coaching, I do offer this service. My email is below. Just send me a brief about your case. And I'll get back to you, inshallah, about the programs I offer and how I can help you. And if you haven't grabbed a copy of the book, please do. It's packed with so much information that will help you in your healing journey. You know, it's the best investment you can make this Ramadan. So do grab a copy, have a read of it, and it will really help you with the stages that I have mentioned today. So thank you if you're still with me until now. May Allah bless you all, inshallah. Thank you for your continued support and do subscribe to the channel if you would like more related content. There are so many subjects coming in Chala that I'm going to be speaking about. So stay tuned for those. And until the next podcast, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.